and welcome to Bite Sized Audio on YouTube. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, audiobook narrator, and curator of this channel. On the channel, you can hear my narrations, more than a hundred to date and more to come, of classic short stories, mostly from the Victorian and Edwardian eras, including vintage ghost stories, detective stories, and other classic tales of mystery and suspense. To accompany the narrations, I've put a short profile of the authors in the video description, as well as some general background notes on the stories for those who'd like to know more. If you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe, like, share, leave a comment if you'd like to, and thank you for listening. The Case of Laker Absconded by Arthur Morrison There were several of the larger London banks and insurance offices, from which Hewitt held a sort of general retainer as detective adviser, in fulfilment of which he was regularly consulted as to the measures to be taken in different cases of fraud, forgery, theft, and so forth, which it might be the misfortune of the particular firms to encounter. The more important and intricate of these cases were placed in his hands entirely, with separate commissions, in the usual way. One of the most important companies of the sort was the General Guarantee Society, an insurance corporation which, among other risks, took those of the integrity of secretaries, clerks, and cashiers. In the case of a cash-box elopement, on the part of any person guaranteed by the society, the directors were naturally anxious for a speedy capture of the culprit, and more especially of the booty, before too much of it was spent, in order to lighten the claim on their funds. And in work of this sort, Hewitt was at times engaged, either in general advice and direction, or in the actual pursuit of the plunder and the plunderer. Arriving at his office a little later than usual one morning, Hewitt found an urgent message awaiting him from the General Guarantee Society, requesting his attention to a robbery which had taken place on the previous day. He had gleaned some hint of the case from the morning paper, wherein appeared a short paragraph which ran thus. Serious Bank Robbery In the course of yesterday, a clerk employed by Messrs. Liddle, Neal and Liddle, the well-known bankers, disappeared having in his possession a large sum of money, the property of his employers, a sum reported to be rather over fifteen thousand pounds. It would seem that he had been entrusted to collect the money in his capacity of walk clerk from various other banks and trading concerns during the morning, but failed to return at the usual time. A large number of the notes which he received had been cashed at the Bank of England before suspicion was aroused, we understand that Detective Inspector Plummer, of Scotland Yard, has the case in hand. The clerk, whose name was Charles William Laker, had, it appeared, from the message, been guaranteed in the usual way by the General Guarantee Society, and Hewitt's presence at the office was at once desired, in order that steps might quickly be taken for the man's apprehension, and in the recovery, at any rate, of as much of the booty as possible. A smart hansom brought Hewitt to Threadneedle Street in a bare quarter of an hour, and there a few minutes' talk with the manager, Mr. Leicester, put him in possession of the main facts of the case, which appeared to be simple. Charles William Laker was twenty-five years of age, and had been in the employ of Messrs. Liddle, Neal and Liddle for something more than seven years, since he left school, in fact, and until the previous day there had been nothing in his conduct to complain of. His duties as walk clerk consisted in making a certain round, beginning at about half-past ten each morning. There were a certain number of the more important banks, between which and Messrs. Liddle, Neal, and Liddle there were daily transactions, and a few smaller, semi-private banks and merchant firms acting as financial agents, with whom there was business intercourse of less importance and regularity, and each of these, as necessary, he visited in turn, 
collecting cash due on bills and other instruments of a like nature. He carried a wallet, fastened securely to his person by a chain, and this wallet contained the bills and the cash. Usually at the end of his round, when all his bills had been converted into cash, the wallet held very large sums. His work and responsibilities, in fine, were those common to walk clerks in all banks. On the day of the robbery he had started out as usual, possibly a little earlier than was customary, and the bills and other securities in his possession represented considerably more than fifteen thousand pounds. It had been ascertained that he had called in the usual way at each establishment on the round, and had transacted his business at the last place by about a quarter past one, being then, without a doubt, in possession of cash to the full value of the bills negotiated. After that, Mr. Leicester said, yesterday's report was that nothing more had been heard of him. But this morning there had been a message to the effect that he had been traced out of the country, to Calais at least, it was thought. The directors of the society wished Hewitt to take the case in hand personally, and at once, with a view of recovering what was possible from the plunder by way of salvage also, of course, of finding Laker, for it is an important moral gain to guarantee societies as an example if a thief is caught and punished. Therefore Hewitt and Mr. Leicester, as soon as might be, made for Messrs. Little, Neal, and Liddles, that the investigation might be begun. The bank premises were quite near, in Leadenhall Street. Having arrived there, Hewitt and Mr. Leicester made their way to the firm's private rooms. As they were passing an outer waiting-room, Hewitt noticed two women. One, the elder, in widow's weeds, was sitting with her head bowed in her hand over a small writing-table. Her face was not visible, but her whole attitude was that of a person overcome with unbearable grief, and she sobbed quietly. The other was a young woman of twenty-two or twenty-three. Her thick black veil revealed no more than that her features were small and regular, and that her face was pale and drawn. She stood with a hand on the elder woman's shoulder, and she quickly turned her head away as the two men entered. Mr. Neal, one of the partners, received them in his own room. "'Good morning, Mr. Hewitt,' he said, when Mr. Leicester had introduced the detective. "'This is a serious business.' "'Very. I think I am sorrier for Laker himself than for anybody else, ourselves included. Or, at any rate, I am sorrier for his mother. She is waiting now to see Mr. Liddell as soon as he arrives. Mr. Liddell has known the family for a long time. Miss Shaw is with her too, poor girl. She is a governess, or something of the sort, and I believe she and Laker were engaged to be married. It's all very sad.' "'Inspector Plummer, I understand,' Hewitt remarked, "'has the affair in hand on behalf of the police?' "'Yes,' Mr. Neal replied. "'In fact, he's here now, going through the contents of Laker's desk, and so forth. He thinks it's possible Laker may have had accomplices. Will you see him?' "'Presently. Inspector Plummer and I are old friends. We met last, I think, in the case of the Stanway cameo, some months ago.' "'But first, will you tell me how long Laker has been a walk clerk?' "'Barely four months, although he has been with us altogether seven years. He was promoted to the walk soon after the beginning of the year.' "'Do you know anything of his habits, what he used to do in his spare time, and so forth?' "'Not a great deal. He went in for boating, I believe, though I have heard it whispered that he had one or two more expensive tastes expensive that is for a young man in his position mr neal explained with a dignified wave of the hand that he peculiarly affected he was a stout old gentleman and the gesture suited him you have no reason to suspect him of dishonesty before i take it oh no he made a wrong return once i believe that went for some time undetected but it turned out, after all, to be a clerical error, a mere clerical error. Do you know anything of his associates outside of the office? No. How should I? 
I believe Inspector Plummer has been making inquiries as to that, however, of the other clerks. Here he is, by the by, I expect. Come in. It was Plummer who had knocked, and he came in at Mr. Neal's call. He was a middle-sized, small-eyed, impenetrable-looking man, as yet of no great reputation in the force. Some of my readers may remember his connection with that case, so long a public mystery, that I have elsewhere fully set forth and explained, under the title of the Stanway Cameo Mystery. Plummer carried his billycock hat in one hand, and a few papers in the other. He gave Hewitt good morning, placed his hat on a chair, and spread the papers on the table. "'There's not a great deal here,' he said. "'But one thing's plain. Laker had been betting. See here, and here, and here.' He took a few letters from the bundle in his hand. Two letters from a bookmaker about settling. Wonder he trusted a clerk. Several telegrams from tipsters, and a letter from some friend, only signed by initials, asking Laker to put a sovereign on a horse for the friend with his own. I'll keep these, I think. It may be worth while to see that friend, if we can find him. Ah, we often find it's betting, don't we, Mr. Hewitt? Meanwhile, there's no news from France yet. You are sure that is where he is gone? asked Hewitt. Well, I'll tell you what we've done as yet. First, of course, I went round to all the banks. There was nothing to be got from that. The cashiers all knew him by sight, and one was a personal friend of his. He had called as usual, said nothing in particular, cashed his bills in the ordinary way, and finished up at the Eastern Consolidated Bank at about a quarter past one. So far there was nothing whatever. But I had started two or three men, meanwhile, making inquiries at the railway stations, and so on. I had scarcely left the Eastern Consolidated when one of them came after me with news. He had tried Palmer's tourist office, although that seemed an unlikely place, and there struck the track. Had he been there? Not only had he been there, but he had taken a tourist ticket for France. It was quite a smart move, in a way. You see, it was the sort of ticket that lets you do pretty well what you like. You have the choice of two or three different routes to begin with, and you can break your journey where you please, and make all sorts of variations, so that a man with a ticket like that, and a few hours' start, could twist about on some remote branch route, and strike off in another direction altogether, with a new ticket from some out-of-the-way place, while we were carefully sorting out and inquiring along the different routes he might have taken. Not half a bad move for a new hand. But he made one bad mistake, as new hands always do. <laughs> as old hands do, in fact. Very often, he was fool enough to give his own name, C. Laker, although that didn't matter much, as the description was enough to fix him. There he was, wallet and all, just as he had come from the Eastern Consolidated Bank. He went straight from there to Palmer's, by the by, and probably in a cab. We judged that by the time. He left the Eastern Consolidated at a quarter past one, and was at Palmer's by twenty-five past, ten minutes. The clerk at Palmer's remembered the time, because he was anxious to get out to his lunch, and kept looking at the clock, expecting another clerk in to relieve him. Laker didn't take much in the way of luggage, I fancy. We inquired carefully at the stations, and got the porters to remember the passengers for whom they had been carrying luggage, but none appeared to have had any dealings with our man. But that, of course, is as one would expect. He'd take as little as possible with him, and buy what he wanted on the way, or when he'd reached his hiding-place. Of course I wired to Calais. It was a Dover to Calais route ticket— and sent a couple of smart men off by the 8.15 mail from Charing Cross. I expect we shall hear from them in the course of the day. I am being kept in London in view of something expected at headquarters, or I should have been off myself. That is all, then, up to the present. Have you anything else in view? That's all I've absolutely ascertained at present. As for what I'm going to do— A slight smile curled Plummer's lip— well, I shall see. I've a thing or two in my mind. Hewitt smiled slightly himself. He recognised Plummer's touch of professional jealousy. Very well, he said, rising. I'll make an inquiry or two for myself at once. 
perhaps, Mr. Neal, you'll allow one of your clerks to show me the banks, in their regular order, at which Laker called yesterday. I think I'll begin at the beginning. Mr. Neal offered to place at Hewitt's disposal anything or anybody the bank contained, and the conference broke up. As Hewitt, with the clerk, came through the rooms, separating Mr. Neal's sanctum from the outer office, he fancied he saw the two veiled women leaving by a side door. The first bank was quite close to Little Neal and Liddles. There the cashier, who had dealt with Laker the day before, remembered nothing in particular about the interview. Many other walk clerks had called during the morning, as they did every morning, and the only circumstances of the visit that he could say anything definite about were those recorded in figures in the books. He did not know Laker's name till Plummer had mentioned it in making inquiries on the previous afternoon. As far as he could remember, Laker behaved much as usual, though really he did not notice much. He looked chiefly at the bills. He described Laker in a way that corresponded with the photograph that Hewitt had borrowed from the bank. A young man with a brown moustache and ordinary-looking, fairly regular face, dressing much as other clerks dressed. Tall hat, black cutaway coat, and so on. The numbers of the notes handed over had already been given to Inspector Plummer, and these Hewitt did not trouble about. The next bank was in Cornhill, and here the cashier was a personal friend of Laker's, at any rate an acquaintance, and he remembered a little more. Laker's manner had been quite as usual, he said. Certainly he did not seem preoccupied or excited in his manner. He spoke for a moment or two of being on the river on Sunday and so on, and left in his usual way. "'Can you remember everything?' he said. Hewitt asked. "'If you can tell me, I should like to know exactly what he did and said to the smallest particular.' "'Well, he saw me a little distance off. I was behind there, at one of the desks, and raised his hand to me, and said, "'How do you do?' I came across and took his bills, and dealt with them in the usual way. He had a new umbrella lying on the counter, rather a handsome umbrella, and I made a remark about the handle. He took it up to show me, and told me it was a present he had just received from a friend. It was a gorse-root handle, with two silver bands, one with his monogram, C.W.L. I said it was a very nice handle, and asked him whether it was fine in his district on Sunday. He said he had been up the river, and it was very fine there, and I think that was all. Thank you. Now, about this umbrella. Did he carry it rolled? Can you describe it in detail? Well, I've told you about the handle, and the rest was much as usual, I think. It wasn't rolled, just flapping loosely, you know. It was rather an odd-shaped handle, though. I'll try and sketch it, if you like, as well as I can remember. He did so, and Hewitt saw in the result rough indications of a gnarled crook, with one silver band near the end, and another, with the monogram, a few inches down the handle. Hewitt put the sketch in his pocket, and bade the cashier good day. At the next bank the story was the same as at the first. There was nothing remembered but the usual routine. Hewitt and the clerk turned down a narrow paved court, and through into Lombard Street for the next visit. The bank, that of Buller, Clayton, Lads and Company, was just at the corner at the end of the court, and the imposing stone entrance porch was being made larger and more imposing still, the way being almost blocked by ladders and scaffold poles. Here there was only the usual tale, and so on through the whole walk. The cashiers knew Laker only by sight, and that not always very distinctly. The calls of walk clerks were such matters of routine that little note was taken of the persons of the clerks themselves, who were called by the names of their firms, if they were called by any names at all. Laker had behaved much as usual, so far as the cashiers could remember, and when finally the Eastern Consolidated was left behind, nothing more had been learnt than the chat about Laker's new umbrella. Hewitt had taken leave of Mr. Neal's clerk, and was stepping into a hansom when he noticed a veiled woman in widow's weeds, hailing another hansom a little way behind. He recognised the figure again, 
and said to the driver, "'Drive fast to Palmer's tourist office, but keep your eye on that cab behind, and tell me presently if it is following us.' The cabman drove off, and after passing one or two turnings, opened the lid above Hewitt's head, and said, "'That there other cab is a following us, sir, and keeping about even distance all along.' "'All right, that's what I wanted to know. Palmer's now.' At Palmer's, the clerk who had attended to Laker remembered him very well, and described him. He also remembered the wallet, and thought he remembered the umbrella, was practically sure of it, in fact, upon reflection. He had no record of the name given, but remembered it distinctly to be Laker. As a matter of fact, names were never asked in such a transaction, but in this case Laker appeared to be ignorant of the usual procedure— as well as in a great hurry, and asked for the ticket and gave his name all in one breath, probably assuming that the name would be required. Hewitt got back to his cab and started for Charing Cross. The cabman once more lifted the lid and informed him that the hansom with the veiled woman in it was again following, having waited while Hewitt had visited Palmer's. At Charing Cross, Hewitt discharged his cab and walked straight to the lost property office. The man in charge knew him very well, for his business had carried him there frequently before. "'I fancy an umbrella was lost in the station yesterday,' Hewitt said. It was a new umbrella, silk, with a gnarled gorse-root handle and two silver bands, something like this sketch. There was a monogram on the lower band— C. W. L. were the letters. Has it been brought here? Oh, there was two or three yesterday, the man said. Let's see. He took the sketch and retired to a corner of his room. Oh, yes, here it is, I think. Isn't this it? Do you claim it? Well, not exactly that, but I think I'll take a look at it, if you'll let me. By the way, I see it's rolled up. Was it found like that? "'No, the chap rolled it up what found it. Porter he was. It's a fad of his, rolling up umbrellas close and neat, and he's rather proud of it. He often looks as though he'd like to take a man's umbrella away and roll it up for him when it's a bit clumsy done. <laughs> Rum fad, eh?' <laughs> "'Yes, everybody has his little fad, though. Where was this found? Close by here?' "'Oh, yes, sir, just there, almost opposite this window, <laughs> in the little corner.' "'About two o'clock?' Uh, "'About that time, more or less.' Hewitt took the umbrella up, unfastened the band, and shook the silk out loose. Then he opened it, and as he did so, a small scrap of paper fell from inside it. Hewitt pounced on it like lightning. Then, after examining the umbrella thoroughly, inside and out, he handed it back to the man, who had not observed the incident of the scrap of paper. "'That will do, thanks,' he said. "'I only wanted to take a peep at it. "'Just a small matter connected with a little case of mine. "'Good morning.' "'He turned suddenly, and saw, "'gazing at him with a terrified expression from a door behind, "'the face of the woman who had followed him in the cab. "'The veil was lifted, "'and he caught but a mere glance of the face "'ere it was suddenly withdrawn. "'He stood for a moment, to allow the woman time to retreat, and then left the station and walked towards his office close by. Scarcely thirty yards along the strand he met Plummer. "'I'm going to make some much closer inquiries all down the line as far as Dover,' Plummer said. "'They wire from Calais that they have no clue as yet, and I mean to make quite sure, if I can, that Laker hasn't quietly slipped off the line somewhere between here and Dover. "'There's one very peculiar thing,' Plummer added confidentially. "'Did you see the two women who were waiting to see a member of the firm at Little, Neil and Liddles?' "'Yes, Laker's mother and his fiance. I was told. "'That's right. Well, do you know, that girl, Shaw her name is, has been shadowing me ever since I left the bank. <laughs> of course, I spotted it from the beginning. These amateurs don't know how to follow anybody, and, as a matter of fact, she's just inside that jeweller's shop door behind me now, 
pretending to look at the things in the window. But it's odd, isn't it? Well, Hewitt replied, of course it's not a thing to be neglected. If you look very carefully at the corner of Villiers Street, without appearing to stare, I think you will possibly observe some signs of Laker's mother. She's shadowing me. Plummer looked casually in the direction indicated, and then immediately turned his eyes in another direction. "'I see her,' he said. "'She's just taking a look round the corner. That's a thing not to be ignored. Of course, the Laker's house is being watched. We set a man on it at once yesterday. But I'll put someone on now to watch Miss Shaw's place, too. I'll telephone through to Liddles. Probably they'll be able to say where it is.' and the women themselves must be watched, too. As a matter of fact, I had a notion that Laker wasn't alone in it, and it's just possible, you know, that he has sent an accomplice off with his tourist ticket to lead us a dance while he looks after himself in another direction. Have you done anything? Well, Hewitt replied, with a faint reproduction of the secretive smile with which Plummer had met an inquiry of his earlier in the morning— "'I've been to the station here, and I've found Laker's umbrella in the lost property office.' "'Oh! Then probably he has gone. I'll bear that in mind, and perhaps have a word with the lost property man.' Plummer made for the station, and Hewitt for his office. He mounted the stairs, and reached his door, just as I myself, who had been disappointed in not finding him in, was leaving.' I had called with the idea of taking Hewitt to lunch with me at my club, but he declined lunch. "'I have an important case in hand,' he said. "'Look here, Brett. See this scrap of paper. You know the types of the different newspapers. Which is this?' He handed me a small piece of paper. It was part of a cutting, containing an advertisement, which had been torn in half. Well, "'I think,' I said, this is from the Daily Chronicle, judging by the paper. It is plainly from the agony column, but all the papers use pretty much the same type for these advertisements, except the Times. If it were not torn, I could tell you at once, because the Chronicle columns are rather narrow. Never mind. I'll send for them all. He rang, and sent Kerrit for a copy of each morning paper of the previous day. Then he took from a large wardrobe cupboard a decent but well-worn and rather roughened tall hat, also a coat a little worn and shiny on the collar. He exchanged these for his own hat and coat, and then substituted an old necktie for his own clean white one, and encased his legs in mud-spotted leggings. This done, he produced a very large and thick pocket-book, fastened by a broad elastic band, and said, "'Well,' what do you think of this? Will it do for Queen's taxes, or sanitary inspection, or the gas, or the water supply?' "'Very well indeed, I should say,' I replied. "'What's the case?' "'Oh, I'll tell you all about that when it's over. No time now. Oh, here you are, Kerrit. By the by, Kerrit, I'm going out presently, by the back way. Wait for about ten minutes, or a quarter of an hour, after I'm gone, and then just go across the road and speak to that lady in black with the veil, who is waiting in that little foot-passage opposite. Say Mr. Martin Hewitt sends his compliments, and he advises her not to wait, as he has already left his office by another door, and has been gone some little time. That's all. It would be a pity to keep the poor woman waiting all day for nothing. Now the papers. Daily News, Standard, Telegraph, Chronicle— "'Oh, yes, here it is, in the Chronicle.' The whole advertisement read thus. "'Y-O-B. H-R. Shop Roast. You first. Then tonight. O-2. Second top. Third L. Number 197. Red B-L. Straight Mon. One at a time.' "'What's this?' I asked. "'A cryptogram?' "'I'll see,' Hewitt answered. "'But I won't tell you anything about it till afterwards, so you get your lunch. Kerrit, bring the directory.' This was all I actually saw of this case myself, 
and I have written the rest in its proper order from Hewitt's information, as I have written some other cases entirely. To resume at the point where, for the time, I lost sight of the matter. Hewitt left by the back way, and stopped an empty cab as it passed. Abney Park Cemetery was his direction to the driver. In little more than twenty minutes, the cab was branching off down the Essex Road, on its way to Stoke Newington, and in twenty minutes more, Hewitt stopped it in Church Street, Stoke Newington. He walked through a street or two, and then down another, the houses of which he scanned carefully as he passed. Opposite one which stood by itself, he stopped, and making a pretense of consulting and arranging his large pocket-book, he took a good look at the house. It was rather larger, neater, and more pretentious than the others in the street, and it had a natty little coach-house, just visible up the side entrance. There were red blinds, hung with heavy lace, in the front windows, and behind one of these blinds Hewitt was able to catch the glint of a heavy gas chandelier. He stepped briskly up the front steps, and knocked sharply at the door. "'Mr. Merston?' he asked, pocket-book in hand, when a neat parlour-maid opened the door. "'Yes?' "'Ah!' Hewitt stepped into the hall, and pulled off his hat. "'It's only the meter. There's been a deal of gas running away somewhere here, and I'm just looking to see if the meters are right. Where is it?' The girl hesitated. Uh, "'I'll ask Master,' she said. "'Very well. I don't want to take it away, you know, only to give it a tap or two, and so on.' The girl retired to the back of the hall, and, without taking her eyes off Martin Hewitt, gave his message to some invisible person in a back room, whence came a growling reply of, "'All right.' Hewitt followed the girl to the basement, apparently looking straight before him but in reality taking in every detail of the place. The gas-meter was in a very large lumber-cupboard under the kitchen stairs. The girl opened the door and lit a candle. The meter stood on the floor, which was littered with hampers and boxes, and odd sheets of brown paper. But a thing that at once arrested Hewitt's attention was a garment of some sort of bright blue cloth, with large brass buttons, which was lying in a tumbled heap in a corner and appeared to be the only thing in the place that was not covered with dust. Nevertheless, Hewitt took no apparent notice of it, but stooped down and solemnly tapped the meter three times with his pencil, and listened with great gravity, placing his ear to the top. Then he shook his head, and tapped again. At length he said, "'It's a bit doubtful. I'll just get you to light the gas in the kitchen a moment.' Keep your hand to the burner, and when I call out, shut it off at once, see? The girl turned and entered the kitchen, and Hewitt immediately seized the blue coat, for a coat it was. It had a dull red piping in the seams, and was of the swallow-tail pattern, a livery coat, in fact. He held it for a moment before him, examining its pattern and colour, and then rolled it up and flung it again into the corner. "'Right!' he called to the servant. "'Shut off!' The girl emerged from the kitchen as he left the cupboard. "'Well?' she asked. "'Are you satisfied now?' "'Quite satisfied, thank you,' Hewitt replied. "'Is it all right?' she continued, jerking her hand toward the cupboard. "'Well, no, it isn't. There's something wrong there, and I'm glad I came. You can tell, Mr. Merston, if you like—' that I expect his gas-bill will be a good deal less next quarter." And there was a suspicion of a chuckle in Hewitt's voice as he crossed the hall to leave, for a gas-inspector is pleased when he finds at length what he has been searching for. Things had fallen out better than Hewitt had dared to expect. He saw the key of the whole mystery in that blue coat for it was the uniform coat of the hall porters at one of the banks that he had visited in the morning, though which one he could not for the moment remember. He entered the nearest post-office, and dispatched a telegram to Plummer, giving certain directions, and asking the inspector to meet him. Then he hailed the first available cab, and hurried toward the city. 
At Lombard Street he alighted, and looked in at the door of each bank, till he came to Buller, Clayton, Lads and Companies. This was the bank he wanted. In the other banks the whole porters wore mulberry coats, brick-dust coats, brown coats, and what not, but here, behind the ladders and scaffold poles, which obscured the entrance, he could see a man in a blue coat, with dull red piping and brass buttons. He sprang up the steps, pushed open the inner swing door, and finally satisfied himself by a closer view of the coat, to the wearer's astonishment. Then he regained the pavement, and walked the whole length of the bank premises in front, afterwards turning up the paved passage at the side, deep in thought. The bank had no windows or doors on the side next the court, and the two adjoining houses were old and supported in places by wooden shores. Both were empty, and a great board announced that tenders would be received in a month's time for the purchase of the old materials of which they were constructed. Also, that some part of the site would be let on a long building lease. Hewitt looked up at the grimy fronts of the old buildings. The windows were crusted thick with dirt, all except the bottom window of the house nearer the bank, which was fairly clean, and seemed to have been quite lately washed. The door, too, of this house was cleaner than that of the other, though the paint was worn. Hewitt reached and fingered a hook driven into the left-hand doorpost, about six feet from the ground. It was new, and not at all rusted. Also, a tiny splinter had been displaced when the hook was driven in, and clean wood showed at the spot. Having observed these things, Hewitt stepped back, and read at the bottom of the big board the name Windsor and Weeks, Surveyors and Auctioneers, Abchurch Lane. Then he stepped into Lombard Street. Two hansoms pulled up near the post office, and out of the first stepped Inspector Plummer and another man. This man, and the two who alighted from the second hansom, were unmistakably plain-clothes constables. Their air, gait, and boots proclaimed it. "'What's all this?' demanded Plummer, as Hewitt approached. "'You'll soon see, I think. But first, have you put the watch on number 197, Hackworth Road?' "'Yes. Nobody will get away from there alone.' "'Very good. I am going into Abchurch Lane for a few minutes. Leave your men out here, but just go round into the court by Buller, Clayton, and Lads, and keep your eye on the first door on the left.' I think we'll find something soon. Did you get rid of Miss Shaw? No, she's behind now, and Mrs. Laker's with her. They met in the Strand, and came after us in another cab. <laughs> Rare fun, eh? They think we're pretty green. It's quite handy, too. So long as they keep behind me, it saves all trouble of watching them. And Inspector Plummer chuckled and winked. Very good. You don't mind keeping your eye on that door, do you? I'll be back very soon. And with that, Hewitt turned off into Abchurch Lane. At Windsor and Weeks's, information was not difficult to obtain. The houses were destined to come down very shortly, but a week or so ago, an office and a cellar in one of them was let temporarily to a Mr. Westley. He brought no references. Indeed, as he paid a fortnight's rent in advance, he was not asked for any, considering the circumstances of the case. He was opening a London branch for a large firm of cider merchants, he said, and just wanted a rough office and a cool cellar to store samples in for a few weeks, till the permanent premises were ready. There was another key, and no doubt the premises might be entered if there were any special need for such a course. Martin Hewitt gave such excellent reasons that Windsor and Weeks's managing clerk immediately produced the key, and accompanied Hewitt to the spot. "'I think you'd better have your men handy,' Hewitt remarked to Plummer when they reached the door, and a whistle quickly brought the men over. The key was inserted in the lock and turned, but the door would not open. The bolt was fastened at the bottom.' Hewitt stopped and looked under the door. "'It's a drop-bolt,' he said. "'Probably the man who left last let it fall loose, and then banged the door so that it fell into its place. 
I must try my best with a wire or a piece of string. A wire was brought, and with some manoeuvring, Hewitt contrived to pass it round the bolt, and lift it little by little, steadying it with the blade of a pocket-knife. When at length the bolt was raised out of the hole, the knife-blade was slipped under it, and the door swung open. They entered. The door of the little office just inside stood open, but in the office there was nothing, except a board a couple of feet long in a corner. Hewitt stepped across and lifted this, turning its downward face toward Plummer. On it, in fresh white paint on a black ground, were painted the words, Buller, Clayton, Lads and Company, Temporary Entrance. Hewitt turned to Windsor and Weeks's clerk, and asked, "'The man who took this room called himself Westley, didn't he?' "'Yes.' "'Youngish man, clean-shaven and well-dressed?' "'Yes, he was.' "'I fancy,' Hewitt said, turning to Plummer, "'I fancy an old friend of yours is in this, Mr. Sam Gunter.' "'What, the Hoxton Yob?' "'I think it's possible he's been Mr. Westley for a bit, and somebody else for another bit. But let's come to the cellar.' Windsor and Weeks's clerk led the way down a steep flight of steps into a dark underground corridor, wherein they lighted their way with many successive matches. Soon the corridor made a turn to the right, and as the party passed the turn there came from the end of the passage before them a fearful yell. "'Help! Help! Open the door! I'm going mad! Mad! Oh, my God!' And there was a sound of desperate beating from the inside of the cellar door at the extreme end. The men stopped, startled. "'Come,' said Hewitt. "'More matches!' And he rushed to the door. It was fastened with a bar and padlock. "'Let me out! For God's sake!' came the voice, sick and hoarse from the inside. "'Let me out!' "'All right!' Hewitt shouted. "'We've come for you. Wait a moment.' The voice sank into a sort of sobbing croon, and Hewitt tried several keys from his own bunch on the padlock. None fitted. He drew from his pocket the wire he had used for the bolt of the front door, straightened it out, and made a sharp bend at the end. "'Hold a match close,' he ordered shortly, and one of the men obeyed. Three or four attempts were necessary, and several different bendings of the wire were effected, but in the end Hewitt picked the lock and flung open the door. From within a ghastly figure fell forward among them, fainting, and knocked out the matches. Hello! cried Plummer. "'Hold up! Who are you?' "'Let's get him into the open,' said Hewitt. "'He can't tell you who he is for a bit, but I believe he's Laker.' "'Laker? What, here?' "'I think so. Steady up the steps. Don't bump him. He's pretty sore already, I expect.' Truly the man was a pitiable sight. His hair and face were caked in dust and blood, and his fingernails were torn and bleeding. Water was sent for at once, and brandy. "'Well,' said Plummer, hazily, looking first at the unconscious prisoner, and then at Hewitt. "'But what about the swag?' "'You'll have to find that yourself,' Hewitt replied. "'I think my share of the case is about finished. I only act for the Guarantee Society, you know, and if Lakers proved innocent—' "'Innocent? How?' "'Well, this is what took place, as near as I can figure it. You'd better undo his collar, I think. This to the men. What I believe has happened is this. There has been a very clever and carefully prepared conspiracy here, and Laker has not been the criminal, but the victim.' "'Been robbed himself, you mean? But how? Where?' "'Yesterday morning, before he had been to more than three banks. Here, in fact.' <laughs> "'But then how? You're all wrong. We know he made the whole round, and did all the collection. And then Palmer's office and all, and the umbrella. Why—' The man lay still unconscious. "'Don't raise his head,' Hewitt said. "'And one of you had best fetch a doctor. He's had a terrible shock.' 
Then, turning to Plummer, he went on, "'As to how they managed the job, I'll tell you what I think. First, it struck some very clever person that a deal of money might be got by robbing a walk clerk from a bank. This clever person was one of a clever gang of thieves, perhaps the Hoxton Row gang, as I think I hinted. Now, you know quite as well as I do that such a gang will spend any amount of time over a job that promises a big haul, and that for such a job they can always command the necessary capital. There are many most respectable persons living in good style in the suburbs, whose chief business lies in financing such ventures, and taking the chief share of the proceeds. Well, this is their plan, carefully and intelligently carried out. They watch Laker, observe the round he takes, and his habits. They find that there is only one of the clerks with whom he does business that he is much acquainted with, and that this clerk is in a bank which is commonly second in Laker's round. The sharpest man among them, and I don't think there's a man in London who could do this as well as young Sam Gunter, studies Laker's dress and habits, just as an actor studies a character. They take this office and cellar, as we have seen, because it is next door to a bank whose front entrance is being altered, a fact which Laker must know from his daily visits. The smart man, Gunter, let us say, and I have other reasons for believing it to be he, makes up precisely like Laker, false moustache, dress and everything, and waits here with the rest of the gang. One of the gang is dressed in a blue coat with brass buttons, like a hall porter in Buller's Bank. Do you see? Yes, I think so. It's pretty clear now. A confederate watches at the top of the court, and the moment Laker turns in from Cornhill, having already been mined at the only bank where he was so well known that the disguised thief would not have passed muster, as soon as he turns in from Cornhill, I say, a signal is given, and that board, pointing to that with the white letters, is hung on the hook in the doorpost. The sham porter stands beside it, and as Laker approaches, says, "'This way in, sir, this morning.' The front way's shut for the alterations. Laker, suspecting nothing, and supposing that the firm have made a temporary entrance through the empty house, enters. He is seized when well along the corridor. The board is taken down, and the front door shut. Probably he is stunned by a blow on the head. See the blood now. They take his wallet, and all the cash he has already collected. Gunter takes the wallet, and also the umbrella, since it has Laker's initials, and is therefore distinctive. He simply completes the walk, in the character of Laker, beginning with Buller, Clayton, and Lads, just round the corner. It is nothing but routine work, which is quickly done, and nobody notices him particularly. It is the bills they examine. Meanwhile, this unfortunate fellow is locked up in the cellar here, right at the end of the underground corridor, where he can never make himself heard in the street, and where next him are only the empty cellars of the deserted house next door. The thieves shut the front door and vanish. The rest is plain. Gunter, having completed the round and bagged some fifteen thousand pounds or more, spends a few pounds in a tourist ticket at Palmer's as a blind, being careful to give Laker's name. He leaves the umbrella at Charing Cross, in a conspicuous place, right opposite the lost property office, where it is sure to be seen, and so completes his false trail. Then who are the people at 197 Hackworth Road? The capitalist lives there, the financier, and probably the directing spirit of the whole thing. Merston's the name he goes by there, and I've no doubt he cuts a very imposing figure in chapel every Sunday. He'll be worth picking up. This isn't the first thing he's been in, I'll warrant. But, but what about Laker's mother and Miss Shaw? Well, what? The poor women are nearly out of their minds with terror and shame, that's all. But though they may think Laker a criminal, they'll never desert him. They've been following us about, with a feeble, vague sort of hope of being able to baffle us in some way, or help him if we caught him, or something, poor things. Did you ever hear of a real woman who desert a son or a lover merely because he was a criminal? But here's the doctor. When he's attended to him, will you let your men take Laker home? 
I must hurry and report to the Guarantee Society, I think. But, said the perplexed plumber, where did you get your clue? You must have had a tip from someone, you know. You can't have done it by clairvoyance. What gave you the tip? The Daily Chronicle. The what? The Daily Chronicle. Just take a look at the agony column in yesterday morning's issue, and read the message to Yob, to Gunter, in fact. That's all. By this time a cab was waiting in Lombard Street, and two of Plummer's men, under the doctor's directions, carried Laker to it. No sooner, however, were they in the court than the two watching women threw themselves hysterically upon Laker, and it was long before they could be persuaded that he was not being taken to jail. The mother shrieked aloud, "'My boy! My boy! Don't take him! Oh, don't take him! They've killed my boy! Look at his head! Oh, his head!' and wrestled desperately with the men, while Hewitt attempted to soothe her, and promised to allow her to go in the cab with her son, if she would only be quiet. The younger woman made no noise, but she held one of Laker's limp hands in both hers. Hewitt and I dined together that evening, and he gave me a full account of the occurrences which I have here set down. Still, when he was finished, I was not able to see clearly by what process of reasoning he had arrived at the conclusions that gave him the key to the mystery, nor did I understand the agony column message, and I said so. In the beginning, Hewitt explained, the thing that struck me as curious was the fact that Laker was said to have given his own name at Palmer's in buying his ticket. Now, the first thing the greenest and newest criminal thinks of is changing his name, so that the giving of his own name seemed unlikely to begin with. Still, he might have made such a mistake, as Plummer suggested when he said that criminals usually make a mistake somewhere, as they do, in fact. Still, it was the least likely mistake I could think of, especially as he actually didn't wait to be asked for his name, but blurted it out when it wasn't really wanted and it was conjoined with another rather curious mistake, or what would have been a mistake if the thief were Laker. Why should he conspicuously display his wallet, such a distinctive article, for the clerk to see and note? Why, rather, had he not got rid of it before showing himself? Supposing it should be somebody personating Laker. In any case, I determined not to be prejudiced by what I had heard of Laker's betting." A man may bet without being a thief. But, again, supposing it were Laker, might he not have given his name, and displayed his wallet and so on, while buying a ticket for France, in order to draw pursuit after himself in that direction, while he made off in another, in another name, and disguised? Each supposition was plausible, and in either case it might happen that whoever was laying this trail would probably lay it a little farther. Charing Cross was the next point, and there I went. I already had it from Plummer that Laker had not been recognised there. Perhaps the trail had been laid in some other manner. Something left behind, with Laker's name on it, perhaps. I at once thought of the umbrella with his monogram, and, making a long shot, asked for it at the lost property office, as you know. The guess was lucky. In the umbrella, as you know— I found that scrap of paper. That, I judged, had fallen in from the hand of the man carrying the umbrella. He had torn the paper in half in order to fling it away, and one piece had fallen into the loosely flapping umbrella. It is a thing that will often happen with an omnibus ticket, as you may have noticed. Also, it was proved that the umbrella was unrolled when found, and rolled immediately after. So, here was a piece of paper, dropped by the person who had brought the umbrella to Charing Cross, and left it. I got the whole advertisement, as you remember, and I studied it. Yob is backslang for boy, and it is often used in nicknames to denote a young smooth-faced thief. Gunter, the man I suspect, as a matter of fact, is known as the Hoxton Yob. The message, then, was addressed to someone known by such a nickname. Next, H. R. Shop Roast. Now, in thieves' slang, to roast a thing or a person is to watch it or him. 
they call any place a shop, notably a thief's den. So that this means that some resort, perhaps the Hoxton Row shop, was watched. You first, then tonight, would be clearer, perhaps, when the rest was understood. I thought a little over the rest, and it struck me that it must be a direction to some other house, since one was warned of as being watched. Besides, there was the number 197 and Red BL, which would be extremely likely to mean Red Blinds, by way of clearly distinguishing the house. And then the plan of the thing was plain. You have noticed, probably, that the map of London which accompanies the post office directory is divided, for convenience of reference, into numbered squares. Oh, yes, the squares are denoted by letters along the top margin and figures down the side, so that if you consult the directory and find a place marked as being in D5, for instance, you find vertical division D and run your finger down it till it intersects horizontal division 5, and there you are. Precisely. I got my post office directory and looked for O2. It was in North London and took in parts of Abney Park Cemetery and Cliss Old Park. Second top was the next sign. Very well. I counted the second street intersecting the top of the square, counting in the usual way from the left. That was Lordship Road. Then third L. From the point where Lordship Road crossed the top of the square, I ran my finger down the road till it came to third L, or, in other words, the third turning on the left, Hackworth Road. So there we were, unless my guesses were altogether wrong. Straight Mon probably meant Straight Monica, that is to say, the proper name, a thief's real name, in contradistinction to that he may assume. I turned over the directory till I found Hackworth Road, and found that number 197 was inhabited by a Mr. Merston. From the whole thing I judged this. There was to have been a meeting at the H.R. shop, but that was found, at the last moment, to be watched by the police for some purpose, so that another appointment was made for this house in the suburbs. You first, then to-night. The person addressed was to come first, and the others in the evening— they were to ask for the householder's straight moniker, Mr. Merston, and they were to come one at a time. Now then, what was this? What theory would fit it? Suppose this were a robbery, directed from afar by the advertiser. Suppose on the day before the robbery it was found that the place fixed for division of spoils were watched. Suppose that the principal thereupon advertised, as had already been agreed in case of emergency, in these terms. The principal in the actual robbery, the yob addressed, was to go first with the booty. The others were to come after, one at a time. Anyway, the thing was good enough to follow a little further, and I determined to try number 197 Hackworth Road. I have told you what I found there, and how it opened my eyes. I went, of course, merely on chance, to see what I might chance to see, but luck favoured, and I happened on that coat, brought back rolled up on the evening after the robbery, doubtless by the thief who had used it, and flung carelessly into the handiest cupboard. That was this gang's mistake. "'Well, I congratulate you,' I said. "'I hope they'll catch the rascals.' "'I rather think they will, now they know where to look.' They can scarcely miss Merston, anyway. There has been very little to go upon in this case, but I stuck to the thread, however slight, and it brought me through. The rest of the case, of course, is plumbers. It was a peculiarity of my commission that I could equally well fulfil it by catching the man with all the plunder, or by proving him innocent. Having done the latter, my work was at an end, but I left it where plumber will be able to finish the job handsomely. Plummer did. Sam Gunter, Merston, and one accomplice were taken. The first and last were well known to the police, and were identified by Laker. Merston, as Hewitt had suspected, had kept the lion's share for himself, so that altogether, with what was recovered from him and the other two, nearly eleven thousand pounds was saved for Messrs. Liddle, Neal, and Liddle. 
Marston, when taken, was in the act of packing up to take a holiday abroad, and there Cash's notes, which were found, neatly packed in separate thousands, in his portmanteau. As Hewitt had predicted, his gas bill was considerably less next quarter, for less than halfway through it he began a term in jail. As for Laker, he was reinstated, of course, with an increase of salary by way of compensation for his broken head. He had passed a terrible twenty-six hours in the cellar, unfed and unheard. Several times he had become insensible, and again and again he had thrown himself madly against the door, shouting and tearing at it, till he fell back exhausted, with broken nails and bleeding fingers. For some hours before the arrival of his rescuers he had been sitting in a sort of stupor, from which he was suddenly aroused by the sound of voices and footsteps. He was in bed for a week, and required a rest of a month in addition before he could resume his duties. Then he was quietly lectured by Mr. Neal as to betting, and, I believe, dropped that practice in consequence. I am told that he is at the counter now, a considerable promotion. You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by me, Simon Stanhope. If you enjoy these stories and would like to help me to keep producing new content, you can find links in the video description to my Patreon page or to buy me a coffee. Another way to support me is through my Bandcamp page, bitesizedaudio.bandcamp.com, where you can hear my narrations of many more classic short stories, and you can also purchase and download them to keep. This recording is copyright Bite Sized Audio 2024. Thank you for listening.